Um, if you could wait for one, one time again. <laughs> so, yeah. so we have the mining fee calculation question. Yes. That uh, wall of uh, wax. <laughs> well, the funny one about that is we can uh, talk about security exploits. Yes, it is. <laughs> You want to wait for anyone else to get back or just go? Just go. All right. Well, so my question really to you guys would be if you're trying to go estimate a fee, what kind of, I mean, what's kind of an approach you might use? I mean, what kind of data sources could you use? A fee for what exactly? Well, I mean, when I'm sending a transaction, like how much money do I need to go pay to? Get it mined quickly. That's acceptable. You mean? Yeah. Do you think about based on ratio of the size of the transaction? Well, I mean, what we're trying to figure out is what's the fee per kilobyte, right? Or like fee per byte. Ah. Because fees are based on, you know, if your transaction pays more per byte than other people, your transaction is more attractive to miners. Mm. You know, it's got nothing to do with the amount of money you're moving around or anything. It's just purely. How much data are you using? Uh -huh. Yeah, because if you're a miner, like what are you trying to optimize? You're trying to optimize the most amount of fees your blocks going to get. Okay, so for them, monetary standards are less relevant than the size of the data pack. <coughs> yeah, I mean it's not relevant at all. You know, and like in theory, I mean people might try to be altruistic, mm -hmm. but if they're optimizing for most revenue. Mm -hmm. Amount of, amount of fees, fees per byte, it's the thing to optimize for. So I understand from the talking downstairs, you talked earlier on about pushing, pushing data to the blockchain, and someone said that that was a, one of the things that you advocate or think that it's a great thing, but obviously, the more data you push on, the potentially more cost. I'm just not sure advocate would be quite the <laughs> right term. I, I think we should accept that it's possible, we should understand that it's possible, but Advocate is a bit of a strong term there. Okay. But I mean, for at least a normal transaction, though, like it's just, you know, more input you have, more input you have. That's, that uses the bytes. You know, I think that's a separate question than like the so called data. Is there a default amount that's, that's at the moment being paid for per kilobyte or per megabyte? Not anymore. It's just a, it's a, it's a free it's a, Yeah, it's a supply and demand market. Okay. Right. So think of it from my point of view. If I'm a miner, how do I make the most money? I have one megabyte of block space, mm. and I'm going to fill it with transactions that pay the most. Mm. And the way that that counting works is most fees per byte. Mm. There's nothing in the protocol that makes me earn money if people move more money or less. You know, from my strictly rational, economically rational, short-term point of view, I want to stuff that block full of transactions that they do. But can they be selected? Can the miners be selected? Of course, they can do all kinds of things. Really? But it doesn't give them any advantage. I mean, if you pay a high fee transaction, mm -hmm. and I don't mind, I am leaving money on the table, but I can yeah, go yeah. otherwise earn. Does that mean that somebody can uh, offer to pay more per buy uh, then transactions are, are earning, then, therefore the block is going to fill up with data that's not non-transactions. In theory, yes. In practice, I mean, nobody bothers doing that because people trying to do transactions seem to be able to pay the most. Yeah. But, you know, most miners have, um, like, most miners, they just have the default um, so-called standardist rules in Bitcoin, which, you know, prevent certain things from being mined, but for the most part, it's a free-for-all. I just thought there was transactions going on, and then after a certain amount of transactions, a, a block is closed no. because of, it's so that they're all back different. No, it's not at all like that, because blocks are found randomly, ah. right? It's not like you get a certain number of transactions and you close up a block, it's rather, people are constantly trying to find a block, and they'll put in the block whatever they can go mine at this moment. Okay, so no talk? Blocks, but aren't all blocks? They're not the same. 
and it when the when the isn't the idea of the blockchain they all contiguous. Well, well my point is that like a block can be found at any moment, mm -hmm. right? So a miner, given that they could find a block at any moment, mm -hmm. they have to think in terms of what will go earn them the most money should they find that block. Mm -hmm. And the way to earn the most money is by filling that block with the transactions that pay the most fee per byte. Right? Because nothing else in the protocol will make them earn money directly for blocks. You know, you have the block reward, the twenty five currently twenty five bitcoins per block that you'll earn well, that's fine. and then transaction fees and that's it. Well, the the average of the transaction fees is there any figure for that? It must be here. Well, so, so if we're gonna talk about transaction fees and how to mm -hmm. determine them. I mean the question to you guys is well, how would you figure out what, what you need to pay? I mean you I mean how do you know what type of transaction fee would outbid other people? Mm -hmm. Probably. Well, remember, RBF doesn't tell you anything but the first transaction fee you try, right? Yeah. RBF just lets you change it if you get it wrong. Yeah. You get it too, uh, that's where you get it too low. Yeah. Because when you get it too yeah. high, you will pull it too high. Yeah, if you get it too high, you're just overpaying. Yeah. That's that. yeah. <laughs> but, but suppose you had no information about what other people were paying. What would you do? You just start low and talk about Yeah. Yeah, so. Do you have a strategy for that? Sorry? Do you have a particular strategy for that? <laughs> could do it like a Bitcoin's auction, like, like Google does. Ah, but with an auction, though, I mean, you just got one penny at a time. I, I guess the thing is, so like, let's let's look at this in detail. Like, maybe with like our RBF or the auction thing, like, how exactly would that work? You know, what would your wallet software do? I mean, what do I send a transaction when I first try? Like, but do you not have one penny? Or you have victory auction works. Anyone that makes a bid higher than anyone else is always resolved down to one penny higher than the last bid. But if I'm a miner, why would I want to do that? Why would I just take that's one way of approaching the problem because sure. then it always just stacks. You know, but, but again, if I'm a miner, mm -hmm. right? When someone gives me a transaction paying more money, mm -hmm. so why would I ever turn that money down? Sure. But how about picking the lowest from the previous book? Lowest transaction fee that got in. Okay, so we pick so the lowest transaction fee that got in. Now, if I'm a miner, okay, is there anything I can do to that number to inflate the value? You can put in your own. I mean, remember, like I'm filling the block with transactions. I can put my own transactions in there. Mm -hmm. and those transactions can pay any fee. Yeah. So if I go fill up a block with transactions that pay, say, Bitcoin per byte, mm -hmm. and uh, your code goes along and says, oh, the lowest is a Bitcoin per byte, well, better get the mm -hmm. yeah. get the wallet out so it pay higher. Yeah. Is, is there any, uh, apart, apart from economic incentive, to, uh, is, is there any rule? About the that you need to fill up the blocks as much as possible, or is it just economic incentive? The yeah, more transactions incentive. you put in, the more money yeah, you earn. Incentive. Miners are free to produce blocks as small as they want. Yeah. It sounds very muddy and very chaotic. Is it? Are you really saying that's that? It's that. Well, I'm saying let's just think through the. Let's can think you through this. Can the maple or something? Hmm? Maple? Can you do that? Okay. So, if you're looking at the mempool then. I mean, what specifically would you look at? The transaction fees. In there. Okay. Well, how? Like, but an example is we could say take sort the mempool and take the part of the mempool that corresponds to one megabyte worth of transactions. All right. We could assume that miners would be mining that. All right. And replace the last one. Sure. Yeah, and then. Pick something in between. Fee that is just slightly higher than the last one yeah. you used to fill up your one fee. Okay. Now, what happens if I happen to control every node that you're connected to? Mm. I mean, I could still spend it with a lot of Yeah, I could send you any any fee I wanted. But are are these if you? These, trans yeah, yeah, these transactions are not automatically broadcasted to other nodes. Well, how do you know that they're actually getting to other nodes? Yeah, but, okay. yeah, but like if I control your internet connection. No, no, but, but if you're filling up your the mempool, 
with transactions with like one Bitcoin transaction. But how do those transactions are, going, are those transactions not going to other mempools that for well, other miners that would then suddenly mine your oh now I have to pay one Bitcoin? Well they might. Mm -hmm. But I mean if I have if I have control of every node you're connected to, mm -hmm. there's no guarantee that's gonna happen. And I could go test this by broadcasting you transactions and mm -hmm. seeing it if they leak out somewhere else. Yeah. And the moment that stops happening, I can assume great I have you under my control. And I can feed anything I want to. Yeah. So should you get in your own interest to forward? Because uh, I think there's an option in Bitcoin you can <coughs> put forwarding uh, transactions to save uh, bandwidth. Yeah, there's yeah. that too. But I mean, uh, but most people don't use that. No. Okay. Yeah. But I mean, it's like actually an incentive to do. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The, the, yeah. The additional incentive. Yeah. 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 But to, mm -hmm. by, by default, to how many peers is it broadcasted? Yeah. Well, no, you, by default, you broadcast every peer you have connected to. Yeah, but it, it, every mm -hmm. peer you're connected to, there's a limit to them, there's a setting for them? No, the only setting in Bitcoin Core right now is either you do or do not broadcast transactions. Okay, why is, why is not every peer in the network connected to you? Well, there's yeah. thousands of peers in the network. Yeah, but the, so we can't have everyone connected. No, no, you don't. I understand that. That's why I'm asking. So you, you can't connect to everyone, but to how many are you connected by default? Uh, by outgoing? default, outgoing is eight. Eight. And yeah. incoming, we allow up to, uh, I think it's 120 mm -hmm. peers by default. Okay. So by default, you connect to eight peers. Outgoing. Outgoing. Yeah, to broadcast yeah and you allow any number uh, of peers up to 120. Yeah, but you still broadcast to all 120. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So yeah. you initiate the connection eight yeah. times, eight and all the other ones are incoming connections, but otherwise they're the same. Outgoing or incoming are the same, yeah. just connection. In the incoming, um, in both incoming and outgoing, when you learn about date, a transaction, you inform everyone. But there's a bit nuance there. I mean, we actually um, trickle out transaction announcements for privacy reasons, and it's a little more efficient if you don't just inform everyone at the exact same time. But essentially, you will at some point have informed everyone if they don't already tell you that they already knew about the transaction. But if you would increase the number of peers that you connect to, would there, would there be a higher chance that your transaction gets mined? Not really. Because it's picked up by other miners quicker than if you wait for the network to send Pretty much meaningless. I mean, transactions get around the network in seconds. So it sounds like we can't trust what's in the blockchain, we can't trust what's in the mempool. Mm -hmm. The value overall in the blockchain is validation of transactions. If you want to send a transaction, a single transaction and it gets validated once, twice, three times, okay, then it passes through and it continues to get validated by more and more mm -hmm. over time. Right, yeah. That's the overall real values in the whole network that this that can actually happen. And get, so what you're talking about is of other externalities of the, of the blockchain that you know, I'm just you know. talking about the very simple thing of there's a fixed point blockchain space. Mm -hmm. And how are you going to outbid other people to get your transaction line versus others? And how do you figure out what your bid needs to be? And we're not talking about like bigger issues right now. Just purely how do you determine what transactions you need to pay to get but isn't it it's automatic at the moment, isn't it? There's some automatic Process or is it? Well, I mean, we're just trying to figure out what should the process be. Remember, the automatic process is not baked into the consensus. The automatic process is something wallets do, and not all of them are automatic. No, and, and still you have the option to adjust it yourself. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. What are you going to say? Okay. I mean, this is a rhetoric question. Are you really asking the question? Well, we're we're, <laughs> we're trying to define. We're trying to figure out what is the way to do this. Because there's a lot more nuance than just like pay a fee. You seem to know the answer. But you oh, I, I very much know the answer. Yeah. Right? And in fact, I very much know that there isn't necessarily an answer. Mm. But you related it. To By the way, uh, thought you as a uh, Reddit uh, expert, could it be that you can't post too much links on Reddit? Yeah, at some point, Andy. So five minutes it. or a quarter yeah. after your okay, because I'm looking for a way to okay. So, um, so you have to argue and just try it, but then 
if all the nodes are connected to are again compromised or one. Yeah, I mean, when when you send an RBF thing, I mean, what guarantee is that the yeah. miners are? Yeah. You know, you might think that it didn't get to miners, but in reality, someone was just trying to fool you. So it seems the only reasonable approach is to set it to your own perceived fair value. <laughs> <laughs> Well, so, so here, maybe here's a different question. Let's suppose we did have a way of being absolutely sure that our transaction got to miners. Yeah. Right. So we've got some proof that some people in this like non-self-selected set got our transaction. Could we go and take that proof and then use it to go and maybe build a cryptocurrency? Right. Because that proof says that we published something. Right. Now we have proof that we published something. But if we have proof that we published something, then I can go give you that proof too. And then that proof can be used as an anti-double spend mm -hmm. mechanism. So if we had the ability to like be absolutely sure that we got our transactions to miners, we wouldn't need miners in the first place. Mm -hmm. There's some federated um, quasi-agreement that people will subscribe to that agreement and they all they all agree to the terms of a, of a collective kind of bargain. Of course, there's no incentive for them to actually do that. Well, I mean, why, can't, why can't I believe that? Well, I mean, if I'm a miner, why would I go and agree to that agreement when I can just go take whatever transaction fees I see? Right? If the moment the agreement means that I will mine a transaction for a lower fee, I might as well defect and mine the higher fee transaction that I see. But unless, unless some sort of federated agreement, like I'm conceptually blur, in a very blurry way, so thinking of is has collective power because there are so many nodes that agree to that federated agreement, which is at, at a certain ratio or certain spend. Wait, nodes or miners? Nodes. No. Okay, so if you guys are your federation, you have a pile of nodes mm -hmm. agreeing to do something and so on, mm -hmm. and I don't like what your Federation is doing. Mm -hmm. I can go and get together with other people who just like, you know, also agree that it's a bad idea. And we can run our own nodes, we can still move data around. And no matter how many nodes your federation runs, we can just completely bypass that. But, and then does that really disempower the federation of that yeah. process? In terms of running nodes, federations are useless. You can run as many nodes as you want, I can completely ignore what you're doing. Who's The minus. Well, I mean, anyone wants to run a pile of notes. Right. Right. So is a number, just a numbers game? Yep. Okay. Or is it a bidding game or in terms of well, value? Well, if I'm running a Bitcoin node, all that means is I'm moving data around. Mm -hmm. There's nothing I can do to prevent you from moving data around. Mm -hmm. I can only make more data move faster, not the other way around. So the power resides when you get those who are running block. Yeah. So then the federated, federated miners. The federation of miners, yes, they can get power. <coughs> of course, if I'm a miner, I mean, why? What's incentive? Yeah, yeah like what's, what's incentive going to punish me for accepting a high fee transaction? I guess it could, but it seems kind of nuts. And when people start playing those kind of games, you start wondering what else is the federation going to do? Mm. You know, mm. start censoring transactions. Mm. I'm so curious to find out what the what is the way that it's shaking out. I mean, is it is it that chaotic that this is all so you know dystopian? <laughs> well, I mean, so my argument would be well, given that we can get civil attacked, and what well, we're going to think the mempool is full of transactions that other mempools aren't, and given that miners can put whatever they want in their blocks. The only sane thing to do is go put an upper limit on what fee you're going to pay. Put a human in the loop and say, oh, does this look reasonable? Yeah. I mean, it's not not crazy idea to do estimations based on how to do it. Oh. Oh. And a human have camera groups? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Use different uh, connections like a web browser to check the blockchain or whatever. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And you know, just limit the limit the um, damage any attack can do. 
You know, like if I know I can afford to pay 10 cents per transaction, yeah. and I'd rather pay less if possible, I can use an estimator to try to optimize what, you know, within that zero to 10 cents. And if someone does a civil attack on me, or maybe some miner puts weird fees in their blocks or so on, the worst that can happen is I'll be paying 10 cents, which I can afford. I'm not gonna be that happy, but it's not a disaster. And since if everyone does kind of this sort of thing, you know, puts reasonable limits, well then there's less incentive to bother doing these kinds of attacks. Mm -hmm. And at that point, yeah, I mean, looking at what fees are paid by recent transactions and blocks makes a lot of sense. You know, looking what's in the mempool locally makes a lot of sense. I mean, lots of different strategies to optimize, but ultimately the important thing is just don't screw up if something weird happens. <laughs> like a good example is when that um, 300 Bitcoin fee transaction happened on um, BitGo, they published their estimates for what it would take to get confirmed in a, in a block within, you know, however much time. Well, their estimates only went like this. And that's really strong indication that wasn't a very good estimate because it didn't filter out liars. You know, a better estimate would have just said, oh, that was probably just some mistake and ignored. So look, what you've said so far is that, okay, we, we, we pick a, uh, you need to pick a value, yeah, that you find yourself reasonable and you can afford it, fine. And it, and it needs to be a value that you have reasonably chance of being in the top list of the transactions so that you get into the block? Yeah. No, I'd say a little different. So the, f the maximum value yeah. needs to be something that you can afford to lose. Yeah. But what you actually end up paying may be a lot less. Yeah, okay, but you're going to, to, to find a fee that still sort well, of fits your transaction in the one megabyte? Well, yeah, yeah. So, so you, what, what we want to look at what are other people paying and yeah. how can you outbid them? Exactly. But then you're only competing with the people who want to get transactions in. Right? Yeah. But then uh, it also still needs to be profitable for the miners. Because even if, if everyone would be very well, close to zero, you could still slightly outbid them. And well, them, but I the mean, miner that's, doesn't, doesn't that's a enough. system design. Like, that's a protocol design level. I mean, if fees paid are profitable for miners, there's something wrong with the protocol. All right? We can't assume that, for instance, you, the guy doing the transaction, is going to be altruistic to make the protocol work. The protocol should have an incentive set up so that you will do the thing that. Yeah, but are the miners just then ignoring it? If, uh, yeah, if, so if, if, all, if, if all fees, if there would be no reward, yeah, there was no 25 Bitcoin reward or whatever, but if you purely have to live on the transaction fees, I mean, if the total transaction fee for a block would be under a certain mm -hmm. amount, would they simply ignore mining it? But keep in mind, like mining difficulty adjusts, mm -hmm. if it's consistently too low. Miners will just go out of business and difficulty will go down. Mm -hmm. You know, there's no way for yeah. it. Like, it'll always end up converging towards profitability level of basically zero. All right, because difficulty adjusts automatically based on how much hashing power there is. Mm -hmm. And then people have an economic incentive to either join mining, thereby making it less profitable, or leave mining, thereby making it more profitable. Now, there's no way in the protocol for us to easily say, all right, we're going to make transaction fees have this much value. Mm -hmm. The only problem is that if too many miners quit, then uh, it's bad for security. Yeah. yeah, at some point, there's so little mining that somebody can attack the whole chain you know, within their budget. Mm -hmm. And the problem is we don't know what that budget is. Maybe the NSA can spend $10, maybe they can spend 100 maybe no, they can spend a million. Uh, is that you're talking then about miners sort of quitting mining? Yeah, and, but that, that's like sounds like a, like a permanent situation. But what if the miner is just looking at the mempool and saying, okay, there is still 10 megabytes of the transactions to go and the fees are so low, hey, the next uh, one hour I'm not doing anything. You just switch off for, switch off for one hour and I'll check the mempool again one hour from now and then. If I see more reasonable fees, yes. then I continue again. Yeah. No, that's a theoretical problem, actually. Um, like, there was actually a paper that came out a couple months ago where, which pointed out that in, if there was no inflation subsidy at all, you'd probably have miners turn on and off their equipment yeah. on a very active basis. Just looking at the man, at the yeah. mempool and checking the transactions, yeah. saying, whoa, there's so yeah. many low fee transactions. I'm not mining. I mean, so again, well. this is one of those reasons why I think you cannot have a system without some amount of inflation. So some kind of reward. There, that, yeah. Yeah. But fortunately, we're probably going to have to deal with that problem for another, you know. Four to eight years. Yeah. I hope. And is there, is there a good 
quitting your switching your mobile money, you can also just try to orphan the latest block with enough keys. Yeah. And then yeah. hopefully, if you're lucky, you know, get two blocks. And, uh, mm -hmm. If you have still have power to spend. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, again, like that's kind of a protocol level flaw. From the point of view, someone just doing a transaction, not their problem. I have a side issue here. Um, during the presentation last week, um, a visitor asked, uh, why didn't they give the mining fee of 200,000 euro back to the one who made the mistake? Well, so you, you don't necessarily know who actually made the mistake. Like if that was a coin joint transaction, for instance, mm -hmm. who knows what the inputs and outputs were. were. Mm -hmm. So, what kind of mistake was it? Was but it suppose, uh, suppose that this this really happened. Well, 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 yeah, rather, so what was, was the mistake? Was, we're about. <laughs> all right. So, um, in the media, it yeah. came out that one tried to um, do a transaction good. with yeah. a mining fee of two hundred seventy thousand euros, and the actual amount transferred was the mining fee. So, okay, so they right. said. Uh, they swapped it around. All right. But the, the miner in question offered to pay it back. I guess yeah, yeah. They asked so, someone to come forward and yeah. email them and just verify who, where's the coin should go. And nobody ever did. No. All right. So the question <laughs> I have for the consumers. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's a good chance whoever on, made that on. mistake didn't even notice. Hang on, hang on. Uh, there was a visitor asking, why didn't they give it back? You know, that's. Yeah. No you mean question. So what should I have asked? I think the thing uh, to say is they uh, they tried to give it back but nobody came forward to claim it. Right. I remember someone wanting to send me a small amount of Bitcoin and then he forgot the the one the right. zero dot one zero became one Bitcoin. Yeah. It was two years ago. But so I sent it back so. so the answer is it is possible to give it back and the miner can offer it. Yeah. And then yeah. one could accept that. Yeah. And that's exactly what they did. No one came forward. Right. And it's not safe to just send it back to the inputs because who knows what the inputs are. Yeah. Okay. I mean, they may not even be able to spend them anymore. Yeah. All right. I understand. So, sorry. Nobody knows what the inputs are. Well, yeah. Like the inputs to a transaction aren't necessarily, don't necessarily correspond to the person who you should send funds back to. Like in many cases, sending funds back to the inputs um, will mean the funds get lost. You know, like someone might, for instance, have some kind of hardware wallet mm -hmm. that doesn't let you respend in all cases. Oh, you know, yes, or yeah. like if I send money, you money on Coinbase, you can't send the money back to me on it. It's not. It's not my address. It's Coinbase's address. Yeah. You know, it causes tons and of problems. Coinbase sends it this. on behalf of you, but when you send it back, yeah. they don't have a clue. Uh, yeah. yeah. So how did they know? Who sent it when they asked? Well, that's when you start asking questions. You try to get people to sign messages and hope you got the right answer. All right. But it's a lot safer to like go down that path first. Yeah. All right. You wouldn't want to just blindly send it back. Yeah. Like, I wouldn't be surprised if there's some uh, exchanges out there with buggy software, for instance, that makes these kinds of mistakes and they never catch it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, when you look at how confident Mt. Gox was. Yeah. yeah. Are we ready for the next question? Yeah, I'm good at um, there is no good answer answers. Shall <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we also uh, just do, are there any new, but besides the already existing? Yeah, but there's a few. Yeah. Well, well one, what, one thing I could actually on. say is um, so, in relation to the fee estimation thing, so. Just to recap, I mean, the important thing then with replaced by fee is if you get your estimate wrong and your transaction's still not getting mined, that's the point where you respend it with a higher fee. Yeah. You know, pretty, pretty simple stuff. But, um, but, uh, could you name the. Yeah, of course. There we go. Uh, Art asked, could we get a step by step in slow motion of the demo yesterday? What, uh, first what I showed yesterday? or? Yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah. Got it up here. Then, uh, so that you could write down the steps. <laughs> yeah. Because you, you went like. <laughs> Here, do it. Um, yeah. Did someone get the chat up again? Yeah. It is running now. Uh, yeah. 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 But, but yeah. Okay. So you can just dump it in there and ask questions. 
Yeah, let me go through the main. Oops. In the meantime, I've uh, got a funny one from the uh, uh, Stack Exchange. I keep an eye on the Bitcoin uh, thing there. Someone is asking how long is a Bitcoin? How long? In bytes, they mean them. How long? <laughs> yeah. That's. Uh, yeah, that will be more so. What, 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 what is a Bitcoin? What comment? Is that a joke? Yeah, this is the silly. The git call is in the chest, I see. There's your, uh, there's your main ones. <laughs> Health is a good one. Uh, but you made the ref test. You yes. Added the block, and then you had the BTC commands, and and then yeah, so the coin CI retest. You made a blockchain of a few blocks. If you run the daemon without a rec test and you have a full uh, yeah, yeah, little, wallet, yeah, then you yeah. have a synchronization problem. And that's yeah, then it's well, I mean, that just starts running for a while. Yeah, it takes a while, but it doesn't break anything, but you have a re synchronization problem. Then, oh, we call it a problem, it's feature. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, you gotta yeah. wait for a few okay. hours while we synchronize that, that's the problem. Yeah. Both feature for that. Yeah. Okay. One thing you can do actually is um, copy Bitcoin and then blocks and Bitcoin chain, chain state. Um, let's make sure I get this right. So. <clears throat> Yeah, blocks in chain state, I think so. Yeah, so if you can, if you want to speed that up, you can uh, just copy um, dot Bitcoin slash um, blocks and dot Bitcoin slash chain state. So that's the two databases, like the first one is the all the actual blockchain data, and the second one is the state uh, of the UTXO set and so on. Hopefully I got that right when they get mixed up. But anyway, essentially some of that data, you know, isn't the wallet, but it's the stuff that, you know, um, synchronizes. So if you copy that first one, you trust, basically you're piggybacking off their work, verifying the chain. You know, I often do this when I'm setting up new computers with um, copies of Bitcoin on there. On the other hand, I mean, these days on reasonable hardware with an SSD, it synchronizes fairly quickly, a couple hours. So it's not critical you do that. Main thing is if your internet connection is slow, you probably want to copy the blockchain data from someone else. Okay, yeah. thanks. Just one question again, what you showed yesterday. Right when you were making a transaction, yeah. you were the first step you, you did was look up the unspent transactions. Yeah. Um, and then, okay, you just yeah, pick one. Yeah, uh, that's there, a that's a list on spent. Yeah, man. but is, is there a, a preferred uh, strategy for picking inputs? Are you combining as many small ones, or are you picking the first one that fits? Or it really depends what you're trying to do. I mean, 
In Bitcoin Core itself, we have a knapsack solver for this. So it looks at you know what outputs you have and then tries to find a set of transactions that most closely fit that set of outputs under various constraints. But but you're you're free to pick any yeah. uh, or any combination or there's no yeah. such thing. So long as you're spending more bitcoins in your uh, on the inputs than in your outputs. If it's less, there's a problem. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but other than that, like there's all kinds of different strategies. I mean. There's also strategies depending on whether you want to minimize your short-term fees versus long-term fees. Usually for my code, I just sort um, biggest input first because mm -hmm. I don't want to bother writing knapsack solvers for one-off you know, one test scripts. Yeah. But I probably should add some of that stuff to Python Bitcoin later. Because okay. it, could, it could indeed be quite complex code. Oh, yeah. You find a set yeah. of inputs that sort yeah. of closely match your yeah. outputs. Well, I mean, doing it optimally um, is apparently an NP hard problem. Mm. So, but if you're too close, you end up with dust again. So, it's like you might want to yeah. use one bigger. Well, another thing people do too is they'll often okay. kick something close enough that there's a dust output that's you know isn't worth enough to make it worth spending, and then they just send that extra bit to fees. You know, because it's an output that's so small, mm. right? That you're not going to be able to spend it properly anyway. So you just throw it on to extra transaction fees. Right. And that can arguably be somewhat better privacy in some cases too. But, but, but why would it be to have dust? Because in the end you can have only the number of inputs? Or? Well, it costs money to create an output, right? Because mm -hmm. it's more data. Yes, yeah, more data, so yeah. you expect a higher mm -hmm. prediction. Yeah. Like if I go and send you one Satoshi, it's going to cost you more than a Satoshi to spend it. Yeah. Right? So I might as well send you nothing. Yeah, so even if you combine uh, 10,000 Satoshis as inputs yeah. in one transaction, you still yeah. you create so much data that yeah. you still end up paying. Yeah. That's why Bitcoin, um, we have a what's called the dust limit. Mm -hmm. And it's basically an estimate of what is the minimum value transaction that you can still profitably spend. Mm -hmm. And we just don't allow transactions into the mempool unless, unless all it puts are above the dust limit. Essentially because the reason why you create an output that's less than that would be if you wanted to just add crap to the UTXO set, mm -hmm. which, from a point of view, minor isn't necessarily a bad thing. I mean, it's still more revenue for them, but it's not uh, for the health of the system. Is the transaction fee itself uh, being considered the transaction? The fee it's itself. It's an output. Well, the transaction fee itself is implicit, right? The fee is just mm -hmm. the difference between inputs and outputs. Yeah, okay. So. But isn't it? Can can you see in the blockchain how much fee there is being? There's no field in transactions that's actual fee, which is a bit of a problem in some cases. Sure. So so I can see that this at respect to that, but I cannot see how much they paid for the. Yeah, the only way you can determine what the fee actually was was to add up the outputs, and or sorry, add up the inputs and subtract the value of the outputs. Oh. And the difference is the fee. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you can, but you have to do some extra work. Yeah. And, and see, that's a problem because, as an example, signatures don't sign the transaction fee right now. Which means if you have, say, a, a hardware wallet, right, that doesn't have all the inputs, it has no idea what fee paid was. But is, is the fee not the total fee of the block is? Well, the total fee is the same thing. It's just the fees every transaction. Yeah, but well, the total fee must be known, yeah, because that's awarded to the but yeah, But the point is, you have to do a ton of, math, a ton of arithmetic to figure that out. Right? Well, if I want to know what the total fee in a block was, yeah. I have to go through and add up yeah. every single yeah. input, every single output. You know, so, add the, sum the, up. so the total fee is not stored together with where you. Uh, yeah, it's the not. Base where the reward is. Yeah, no, it's not. It's implicit. Okay, so it looks like the total fee is added to the uh, in the in the Coinbase. Uh, well, I'll think this way: it's like there's a computation, right? They can do to figure out the fee, but that computation, the intermediate results of it, are not committed anywhere in the block. No, but, but, but where, uh, how is the fee getting to the miner then? Because well, the, the point is that a block is valid, yeah. right? If the Coinbase transaction creates a certain number of bitcoins, which is your subsidy, plus the fees paid by every transaction. Yeah, so the total amount of transaction fees in a block is, is in the Coinbase transaction? No, not necessarily. 
because the Coinbase transaction is allowed to be any value. Yeah, it could be less. less. Yes, yeah, it could, it could be, be less. less. Yes. Okay, but if uh, if they would, yeah. if a miner normally yeah. should have the maximum value, which is the total amount of fees plus the reward. Maybe. And if they do it less, then they're sort of taking money yeah. out of their own pocket. I mean, the point is, like, none of this stuff's committed in a way that's easy to verify. You actually have to have a ton of data to compute these things. Mm. You know, as an example, if I give you a block, right, but and I claim to you that the block is valid, but it's invalid because it creates money out of thin air that wasn't paid mm -hmm. for the transaction fees. The amount of data you need to prove that that block was invalid could be gigabytes. Right? <laughs> in theory, every single transaction input could correspond to a one megabyte transaction, and you would need the entire transaction to prove that the fees being paid were invalid. You know, this is why people looking at um, what are called fraud proofs to make it easier to go show that parts of a, a blockchain are invalid. You know, we're looking at things like Merkle sum trees where you hash into the tree the amounts paid at every step. But all that stuff's a long way off. And would it also be useful for a fee market to know what the fee price is? Potentially, it would help. Yeah. If you, if you got, by the way, if you got any ideas about how, uh, and because now you have to get, yeah, using replace by fee, of mm. course, you can kind of pull, um, uh, sure. pull the, the transaction fee. But have you got other ideas about, I mean, is that the way to, to pull the, the current transaction fee? Well, I think the way I describe replace by fee is it makes it, it makes it less risky to go screw up in your estimates. You know, like one, one reasonable strategy for doing replace by fee is you, when you do a transaction, mm -hmm. you pre-sign, say a transaction will be valid after one block, two blocks, three blocks, four blocks, et cetera, that each pay higher and higher fees. And as blocks come in and your transaction isn't mined, you just rebroadcast. So but it's, it's replaced by fee then driving the transaction cost down because everyone is sort of going to yes. underestimate. Yes, that's exactly what it does. Yeah. So in other words, if uh, like Electrum it has now implemented replaced by fee, and I don't know what they exactly did, but if they do it like you would like it to, to be done, uh, they would have uh, done uh, they would have uh, multiple transactions for the for meant for the same purpose. Yeah. And just test out the yeah. first one, which gets uh, transmitted. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, here's an example. If I go send money on my ceiling, which is a wallet I use, if I set too low of a transaction fee, there's nothing I can do other than wait. I mean, who knows how long it'll take. Whereas if I sent it with green bits, which does support fee bumping, I mean, I can use any estimate I want, and if it takes a while, I'll just bump it. You know, it's just much less risk. We could connect up to the question of Niels, who isn't here anymore, but he asked, uh, is it possible to start to store data on the blockchain without burning bitcoins? Yes. Opt for return is one method. I mean, well, you got to define what you mean by burning. If you mean by destroying them, Yes, if you mean burning them as in paying, as in you spending money, no. You're not spending money. Well, well, I'm assuming you mean burning them as in just sending those Bitcoins to unspendable efforts. What I wrote down is without burning Bitcoins. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I think he means yeah. without losing money. Exactly. Well, you're, you're always going to spend money to do this because transaction fees. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. But, but the question is, are you... Is the money you're spending going just to transaction fees or some of it getting sent to unspendable outputs? Mm -hmm. Right. And, yeah, and the problem is, by the way, that if you burn money, the rest of the Bitcoin community gets it. Yeah, yeah. So I was wondering, maybe you know about the story of, do you know the KLF? It's a, a house act or bent or how you would call it. And there's a famous story that uh, they are also kind of artists in the Oh yeah, they're the guys who burned the million, yeah, million pounds. Yeah. 
crazy and bastards. The, yeah, and yeah, but the first thing is the, the, the even better would it be if it wouldn't be a real bounce. Yeah, it would be kind of funny, but it would also be kind of disappointing. But I will, I'm wondering, I don't know how the British bank reacted to this if they just yeah. let it happen. Because the problem is, of course, the British bank could say, uh, you know, uh, start the money press. Uh, yeah. And do you know the story? Yeah. And uh, have you got any, uh, or anybody else? Does, does anyone know how the bank reacted to this? Well, keep in mind that the bank, uh, you know, central banks target given inflation rates. So no matter how much money you go burn, mm -hmm. you're, they'll take it into account the next time they issue more. Okay, so in other words, they the yeah. KLF donated the money to the central bank. Well, not even donated. They don't Basically, care. yes. Yeah, they, they, they just target money supply. Yeah? Yeah. Well, and, and, and depending on... The, the money supply just went down, so the next time they print a bit more. Well, and, and it's even more complex than that, right? Because it's not, it's not actually the central bank that prints money. Mm -hmm. It's rather the banks that print money. So KLF arguably donated money to the banks. Right. Which I suspect wasn't their intent, but... <laughs> yeah, I saw a nice video of Ron Paul, small video, uh, where he was also saying his criticism on inflation <laughs> is that the people spending the money first are, you know, they have the benefit of it yep. because they are printing mm -hmm. free money. And, and that he was also saying that uh, you know that the 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 not so uh, rich people uh, are the most uh, damaged uh, mm -hmm. by the person. But uh, the, the okay, the next yeah, but uh, yeah. could you call them all just to have a index? Well, so uh, so, so, so to get back to my answer, yeah, then, answer. for yeah, the so so there's two e you know there's one easy way, which is you use offer term, which lets you embed. In total, up to about 80 bytes worth of data in a transaction. And the thing is, an off return output can have zero value attached. So you're not destroying bitcoins. Any bitcoin that you're spending goes directly to transaction fees. And if you want to embed more data than that, because currently the default standardness rules in Bitcoin Core only allow one off return transaction per per tra or one off return output per transaction. So you're limited to 80 bytes per transaction. But if you want to store more, or I really would say publish more data, you can go embed it in the script settings instead. And I've actually got a tool to do this. I'll, um, it's in my examples directory, Python Bitcoin loop called publish text. I'll just put that in the chat. And the way it works is by creating transactions that are sort of creating outputs that to spend them you have to, in the script, say, provide data, and that data is then hashed and then verified to be in the correct order and so on. And what published text does is it takes text, adds it so that every line is at least um, 20 bytes long in total, and embeds that in these transactions. And what's neat about that is then you can go and extract that text from the blockchain itself with the um, well known strings command. Essentially, if you do strings in 20 Bitcoin blocks, block, right? The command I just put in the chat, if you run that, you'll re extract all those, all the text data. Similarly, there's a, where is it? Is that a way to put a lot of data? Yes, you can put as much as you want, um, pretty much. And cool. no one can stop it. Well, I mean, people could just stop it, but no one's bothering right now. Mm. There we go. Yeah, there's a website actually that publishes this study about <laughs> bitcoinstrings.com. And there's you know megabytes and megabytes worth of stuff that people have published, including like entire books and big sets of IRC logs and so on. Mm. But if you're on a pruned node, because that's in the script sig, all that data gets discarded. You know, it's on the UTXO set, so. Yeah, like 
here's some of it, which is, from what I can tell, IRC logs from the Bitcoin Wizards channel that someone's put in the blockchain. That's incredible amounts of this stuff. Thing so is, so, so I mean, also all my hard disk where I run. <laughs> oh, no, sorry, I run. <laughs> yeah, you can, run the mouse, so. yeah, yeah. Since you run pruned, all it gets discarded. You know, and this is why I say this isn't storing data so much as publishing it. Right, we're publishing it to a place which everyone's going who binds is going to see. I'm assuming it actually look, of course, and anyone who wants to get it can extract it fairly easily. But there's no guarantee anyone will actually keep this data. You know, it's quite possible if everyone runs prune nodes, they'll never be able to extract it again. But there is a way to publish a lot of data to the blockchain um, and come down to extract it if you don't use prune nodes. Yeah. No. Uh, but small thing, uh, Cornelia will probably here be around four. Okay. So we have one hour and a quarter for pure Peter Kotsa. Yeah. And I have the impression that we have quite a lot of questions. No, no, it's just the, uh, oh, really? the, the, the questions are listed um, a bit higher mm -hmm. in, in the chat. Okay. And so there's only one more left. Um, okay. As far as I know. Uh, that was my question about the deter deterministic questions. But you had, you already um, yeah. asked a lot of them. Yeah. So I, I could, I could uh, go through them. Yeah. And maybe have. A uh, few other ones as a as an extra. Um, I wrote them down. So your, your first question is most of, most of the time, what do you want to solve? Well, that's, that's where you start off with. Then, why do we need global consensus on this application? Uh, what are you trying to prevent from happening? How many copies copies are needed? That's also important because of the fact that you, of course, uh, decentralize it. Is a public ledger with cryptographically signed protected data really needed? Yeah. Right. Is expensive white replication viable? Yeah. <clears throat> How is this fraud going to happen? <laughs> um, uh, if you suppose blockchain, how is that going to solve the problem? <laughs> Why do you have to laugh? <laughs> it's like a bill, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yes. I, I end up doing this all the time to people. There's a new uh, question from Dan, by the way. Right. Uh, so we we're, were just answering this question. Okay. <laughs> Are you inspired to have some sub questions? Or? No, not yet. Or should I just continue? Yeah, keep going. Yeah. Oh, it's pretty informal. Um, <clears throat> How is it going to offer freedom uh, at the expense of ineff inefficiency? I think I got inspired by that. Sorry. But I'm glad to not on this question. He's oh, it's yeah, no, a serious uh, question. Yeah. yeah. I mean. All right. Forget it. How, how are state commitments and state changes relevant? Um, mm. Do the states need to be signed off? Of course. I Depends. Think yeah. Um, how do you know the, that the miner is not feeding you transactions yeah. with the yeah. high fees? Yeah. So that, that was a list that I just wrote down, listening to you just today. And, uh, what days do we have left? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's just um, what, it would be good to have a set of first questions to ask the person when he comes up with this yeah. idiotic idea. Uh, of, of needing a blockchain for solving these problems, you know, these day to day yeah. problems. Yeah, I mean, I think the definitely like you usually can rule out most stuff by just asking what the heck are you actually trying to stop? Sorry? You know, what are you trying to prevent from happening? That one question seems to oh, yeah. rule out a lot of stuff. Okay. And the question from Dan was, what, what do you think about side chains? Yes, that's an interesting one. Of course, I can go and respond as usual with the question, what type of side chains? <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> what are they trying to fix with the side chains? <laughs> <laughs> well, because it's interesting, like there's Blockstream, they're implanting liquid, 
mm -hmm. right? Which I hear is actually pretty far along in terms of getting deployed. But Liquid is run by like a set of companies. You know, it's everyone mm -hmm. who wants to participate in the Liquid side chain runs, uh, I think the term they use is a functionary. And that functionary is one party to an, um, an M of M multisig. Well, I mean, in that model, that you can't even prevent a side chain from happening. There's no interaction with miners or anything. I mean, it's just someone who wants to hold some bitcoins on a multisig, and all the side chain is is just pile of counting. So you are sharing. So then you are sharing in the loop. Yes. Yeah, that's how Liquid works. Yeah. Okay, so it's a multisig. But, that, but it sounds like it can already be done with existing. Yes. Yeah, okay. They're doing it right now. So, with what you then effectively are doing, you are becoming kind of like a partner in their multi-ship, but is, yes. it, is it the owners or? I mean, it could be if you want to do it that way, but usually the same thing given it's a multi-sig would be for every party of the multi-sig who signs the side chain mm -hmm. to be known. Okay, you, you, would, you, should, you should be willing that. You should be willing to build, yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean this is a way, yeah. Yeah, and this is a fancy term for a, a bank composed of a couple of different people who yeah. control the money jointly. Yeah. And the side chain part of it, that's just a data structure to let the people holding the money figure out, well, when you withdraw money from the system, where should it go? And should it be allowed to move? Does Liquid enable those so-called side chains to help other functionality that is desirable, superior, extendable? Well, I mean, the what's in the side chain in the liquid model can be anything. I mean, we could make a so-called side chain between ourselves, you know, pen and paper, and I could go scribble down, you know, I'm going to go give Joe one Bitcoin, and whoever is willing to authentic, you know, look at that pen and paper and actually move money could be said to be part of functionary. I mean, side chain is just a really broad term in that model, mm -hmm. and what. I understand what Liquid's actually doing is taking the Bitcoin code base, changing it a little to remove mining and then add, um, like add um, a simple consensus mechanism among known entities. And then the blocks in the Liquid chain, well, I mean, it's just filled with transactions signed by people who've trusted their money um, to, these, to the people um, signing the multisig. Not really fancy technology at all, but if you make it reliable. Exactly the advantage of liquid. Well, advantage is because all the trading is happening within known entities. Um, trades can happen instantly. Mm -hmm. What about rootstocks? Implementation of side chain? Not really clear to me how it actually works. Oh, um, mm -hmm. Sounds like they have a mining based system. Yeah, but they, they how they they'll actually do it? Quasi tokens, which are. Complicated. Yeah. Well, so the thing with. If you have a side chain that's merge mined, where Bitcoin miners are mining it, mm -hmm. all the stuff that's coming to Blockstream to date, the problem is they're essentially trusting miners. So it's kind of like a multi-sig, but whoever has the most hashing power decides mm -hmm. how many gets moved into the multi-sig. Mm -hmm. And that means if I have majority of hashing power and you have money on the merge mine side chain, mm -hmm. I can arbitrarily take that money. <laughs> and there's nothing you can do about that. So you you were an exponent of what you call tree chains as opposed to side chains, I, I believe. Yeah. And, and what do you see as the difference in, in, in well in simple terms? With tree chains, if if it can ever be made to work, so the idea basically is that all of the validation of transactions is done client side. So miners don't necessarily validate anything. They just, you know, certify the fact that data was published at a certain time. Mm -hmm. and was widely distributed. So the model there is, you know, if I'm going to give you something mm -hmm. of value, I publish the fact that I've given you it. Mm -hmm. And if the protocol where you determine if the, the transfer was real mm -hmm. says, well, let's go to the place where that data should be published and check that I didn't already publish mm -hmm. a competing spend. If you build, you know, if you can do that, you can build up um, Transfer all of scarce things like bitcoins mm -hmm. entirely client side, where your wallet will say, Yes, the protocol was followed, you know, the money wasn't double spent, and it's, so on. It's checking that. Yeah. And, you, and, and you're only checking the stuff you care about. You know, you don't care if he was defrauded, 
because that's not your problem, it's his problem. You know, if he accepts money that's invalid because it was double spent, well, if that's his loss, it's his wallet's screw so that, up. You, but is that more of a force um, multi-node validation in some way to, to kind of increase the validation? No, I'd say it, it's more the opposite. Rather, it forces everyone, everyone's wallet to do their own validation. But is it enough if one wallet just tries to validate something without well, collective but again, validation power? It doesn't matter to you if someone else doesn't validate properly and gets defrauded. It's not your problem. That sounds like a selfish system. It doesn't. It's much better to make a consensus system. Isn't it? Where, where well, but we still have consensus, right? We still have consensus over all the things that were published to the tree chain. And the definition of valid transfer is you publish the fact that you've transferred it. Okay, and other people can see that. Yes, anyone who may want to accept that money can see it. Uh -huh. uh, but people who haven't been told about the transfer, they're not going to see any of the data. Yeah, okay. yeah, and they have no reason to care. Okay, can that system be gained? Obviously, I don't think you'd be proposing it because it's easy to Well, I'd say it's very hard to game it because you're not trusting anyone. The only thing you're trusting is that miners you know, certify the fact that data has been published very widely. And equally, the fact that data hasn't been published, such as a spend. I mean, miners don't do anything in the system other than burn energy committing to history. You know, they don't know what the history is. They can't censor anything because they're missing most of the data. Like when I go send you a transaction, mm -hmm. I can go point you to, all right, from here to here, this coin wasn't spent. Now it is spent. Mm -hmm. But all the data saying what the spend meant, mm -hmm. you know, where the money came from, where it's going, none of that needs to be blockchain. Mm -hmm. You just get this arbitrary little, little data packet which signature returns true on some mm -hmm. anonymous hash, but you don't know why, unless mm -hmm. you have the data behind the hash. And are you saying that a tree chain can put the data, can make a, a set or a, a separate loop from blockchain that can provide? That? Yeah, it's like you're filling in all the, all the details. Okay. All right, and then your wallet validates the full thing. Well, that's a good system. So why are you, are you, I mean, in blockstream, uh, you're critical of Austria because they're, well, they're, keep, keep in mind, there's a huge, huge problem with the system. Which would which one? My tree chain set. Okay. All right. So if I give you a Bitcoin, yeah, I might have to give you say, you know, one or two k worth of data to prove that. Yeah. Well, when you go give him that Bitcoin, you might have to give the proof that I gave you the Bitcoin in the first place, plus the proof that you now gave him the Bitcoin. Now we're up to say two k full bytes worth of data. Yeah. When he gives him the Bitcoin, you better give the proof that I gave you the Bitcoin and then the proof that you gave him the Bitcoin. So it's like a chain. Yeah. yeah. So what's the two million problem? Eventually these proofs become too big. Okay. So All right, there's no way to go. Well then you don't have any advantage in scaling. But do you need all the proof from the beginning or only the last number of transactions? Well, the simplest way to do it is from the beginning. Now, if nobody's validating anything, if you only go back 100 steps, how do you know that 101 one step is, is real? Well, in our public transport, due to privacy reasons, somebody can look at my anonymous travel card <laughs> and see the last entries, but not the complete start of the history and maybe for a lot of transactions that is equally valid. Sure, but I mean, if you don't have the full history dating back to when the coin was generated, I can just create money out of thin air. So, yeah, but unless we do something more clever, you know, you have to have the full history. Isn't that kind of like an IOU? Well, the problem is, but it's not rooted in anything, right? Yeah. The IOU is meaningless because I mean, you go back to the end of the chain that you know about, I mean, where did the IOU come from? It only makes sense when you go back to the beginning when the coin was actually created. Can I think this is a side chain. You can at some point say, like, the poop is getting too big, so I'm going to move to Bitcoin and then uh, yes. pick a new one. Yeah. 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 And, and the thing is, the proposals for side chains have been that you trust miners for that proof, and the Bitcoin chain never validates any of that. You simply assume that the majority of miners will do things the valid way. Potentially with you know some mechanism to show fraud, but there's no plausible way to do that without very advanced math. 
And that advanced math makes tree chains work anyway. So, you know, well, you can move the coins back to the Bitcoin main chain, right? And yes, yeah. But, you know, if your coins are on the side chain, that move the coins back to the Bitcoin main chain thing could be done in a fraudulent way where it, you didn't give permission for that to happen. And that's how miners can steal money. Um, problem is, I, I, we are never going to answer all the questions. No, no, I'm done. These were the questions of this moment. Uh, yeah. this, uh, oh, okay. No, this one. Oh, that's magic for me then. Um, so this question came from the town. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 The the others, were all the other ends? All the other ends? Yeah. 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 Oh, I think you've got one of the other I mean, none of my questions were answered, but uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I have an infinite <laughs> supply of that question. <laughs> yeah. No, but I, uh, I, I wanted to uh, ask David, and I, have you, uh, are there still uh, no questions? Yeah, we're done. Bitcoin's done. <laughs> uh, we just got to write some code now. And we're, uh, everything's fixed. Any questions? Do you have, do you have an opinion on the false torch? Yeah, I Change. already asked a question uh, informally uh, during lunch about yeah. uh, oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah. we are talking about hashes, about numbers, and a lot of data is in uh, language or names and uh, for me there's a challenge uh, regarding to trees to put names in hashes and to have sort orders uh, that's a challenge if you look at archiving of things and you try to use Merkle trees for archiving purposes um, but you already said that there was not a general solution or a library that you know of and it looks mm, maybe like misunderstanding the IPFS integration. So how do you think about IPFS integration to well, I haven't looked at IPFS enough to really you know in detail how the protocol works. But, no, but I mean I, I, IPFS is a Bitcoin are solving quite different problems. Yeah, but do you see any uh, merging of the two possibilities? I expect not that much, actually. I mean, IPFS, the problem they're solving is referring to data. Mm -hmm. You know, IPFS standards go hash data and then have a good way of referring to what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Bitcoin is, I think it was, IPFS doesn't need consensus, right? Because it's based on the data itself. Bitcoin's solving a very different type of problem. No, but you don't see any uh, extra possibilities if they both merge. I don't think they need to merge. I mean, the great thing about IPFS is you don't need consensus. Yeah, you know, consensus well, is not expensive. A, maybe not about uh, merging, but I think the idea is that there will be applications that will use both. Sure. Right? So you, you, for yeah. to build some kind of decentralized application, you use a decentralized blockchain and you use decentralized storage. Which could be IPFS or uh, well, IPFS isn't is necessarily about storage. No. Right. How you actually get the data in IP, IPFS, from at least what I've read, depends. You know, it's more about proving that when you finally get the data, it's the right data. Yeah. Right. It's like I can go give you a hash of a file, yeah, and I can go tell you, or... yeah, you figure out how to get that. But the point thing is, when you do finally get the data, you know you got the thing you were expecting. Yeah. yeah. Okay, you're also the other ones that already did. Hmm? BitTorrents. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. BitTorrents is very similar. Yeah. yeah. But you also have the other things like the CR and StoreJ. Yeah, yeah. Those ones are more about trying to incentivize people to store data. Yeah. Maybe there's some kind of yeah. economic incentive model. Yeah. Instead of uh, BitTorrent, where you don't, if there's no uh, incentive to store anything. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, as an example, like you nearly can do this in Bitcoin, where you create a an output mm -hmm. that spend the output. You must provide data at the bottom of some Merkle tree, and if you go and t you know set up a social precedent that people will continue spending money to these outputs, mm -hmm. right? That make it possible to then recover the data later. You have every incentive to hold on to a copy of the data to be able to do that. There's a big problem though. You don't necessarily have any incentive to give anyone else the data, right? Like suppose I have a movie, you know, mm -hmm. it's a terabyte in size. 
I can create a script. Do you have Springer in front of the yeah, so, <laughs> yeah, suppose I have some, uh, some data like that. <laughs> you know, I could go and create a Merkle tree over that, and then I can go and pay to that tree, particularly if I you can do use a pseudo-random number generator to go pick branches in the tree. So you don't know what part of the tree you're going to need to present in the future. But in the future, you know, you're asked to present one little bit of the tree to go and give up the data. Now it's incentive to keep the tree. So to us out of the data. Why would I ever give you the data? Mm -hmm. Competitor. Yeah, you're a competitor. I mean, I would copy. If you're the person who wants the full thing, we can negotiate a separate price for it. Mm -hmm. But that's not magic. Like that's still pretty limited compared to I think what we really want is to, which is to magically pay people to store data and be able to retrieve it. Yeah. And you can't, you can't in a decentralized system solve the second part of retrieval. You can only try to solve the first part to incentivizing someone at least to a copy. And for all you know, I mean, maybe my, like how many copies do you know are out there? It's most efficient for the people participating in the system to only have one copy. And it's even more efficient if the entire system, mm. all the people claiming to have data in this wonderful decentralized system, well, if Google participates in this, they can just use some Slack space in their data centers to make all the money on the storage system. And God help you if it turns out that Google's participation was just like some unpaid intern who gets fired at the end of the summer and the whole thing gets shut down. Mm -hmm. You know, all you know is that there's one copy out there and that's it. But there's an example like publishers. If a publisher goes broke, um, Google has all the uh, subscriptions, the magazines, and if people are allowed to cache their copy and share it afterwards, that could be an interesting thing. Those things have already exist. But remember, those things are enforced by social and legal mechanisms, yeah. not by tech. Yeah. Trying to force this stuff by tech is really, really hard. Yeah. It's much easier if, I mean, example, if I want to ensure that some data is safe, it's far easier for me to just go pay some money to Amazon knowing that Amazon's entire reputation relies on them making sure that I can get it back from Amazon Glacier. Mm -hmm. And the moment they fail to do so, I'll like go into Hacker News and start complaining to people. That's much, much more likely to work yeah. than cross your fingers and hope some people on some decentralized network hold it. But if somebody <coughs> solves that problem, it would be a very interesting service they could provide. Yeah. World peace would also be very interesting if you solved that. <laughs> I mean, uh, I've also been thinking uh, about getting a pony. <laughs> I, I hear blockchains can get me a pony. But, but if you look at the, the Swarm papers that they published, because they, they have a really complicated incentive scheme yeah. for both storage and for bandwidth uses, which is basically yeah. the retrieval part. But it, I tried to figure it out, but it seems really complicated. A, a lot of these schemes are complicated enough that they don't work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, like I, I actually visited uh, MadeSafe um, about two years ago, and they invited me off to the Troon office. And they spent basically like three days straight trying to convince me that MadeSafe worked. Mm -hmm. And you know they just couldn't. I mean, everything that they brought up, all their crazy incentive systems, I just couldn't see why any of it actually worked. You know, there's always reasons why you could come up with where it would fail. Now, obviously, if people are altruistic, and it's, you know, much like BitTorrent, I mean, BitTorrent, if you look at it from a purely economically rational point of view, it would never work. Mm -hmm. Why would you ever share files for free? But, you know, people are altruistic. They do things that are the common good. They donate money and time and so on. And so the system works very well. But if you start with, let's go make a system that incentivizes people based on money, if that's your starting point, you better have a pretty good argument as to why a rational economic actor will follow the rules you want them to follow. Mm -hmm. And if you can't do that, you're probably actually remaking BitTorrent. But the ugly thing is because you're paying people money, it changes the whole social dynamics. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like if you're volunteer, you know, you're volunteering at a soup kitchen once a week. If I start paying you like ten bucks for that, your whole relationship with that voluntary work is going to change, mm -hmm. and you probably will stop doing it. I'm actually a bit afraid that BitTorrent is going to be going to disappear because of this sort of thing. There are people working on putting uh, 
don't know, I had a Bitcoin or something or something yeah. thing inside Bitcoin. Yeah. And then I'm pretty afraid yeah. but I'm just too long. Yeah. Well, the Tor community, they're um, quite concerned about that stuff too. Yeah, so many yeah. people try to come up with schemes to pay Tor notes. Yeah. But I mean, Tor note can't prove to you it's not keeping locks. You know, that's problem number one. Yeah. And the sort of people who are not going to keep logs are the altruists. They're doing, you know, donating bandwidth to Tor to the goodness of their hearts, not the people trying to make a buck. And then the last thing you want to do is start attracting the latter instead of attracting the former. I've got a question to you that just is a simple thing because basically the model that we've been pushing, uh, my company's bit tuned, probably heard of it, but basically we've got an earning model where. When, in, when a typical Bitcoin transaction, I think the transaction is made at the end of two parties. But when in our model, which we're trying to shortly expand, you've got a buyer, a seller, but then there, it's witnessed by mm. uh, what, five mm. other previous buyers of that song who all, also get, a, get a, a percentage of the transaction because they were previous buyers. Because of that, I wonder if I've always speculated that maybe there's a consensus picture that can be built up because of that model, because it's what you were talking about in your, in your uh, tree chain is that you've got a problem with, you know, I do I, this, this transaction to this guy and then to that guy, but then how do you build really the consensus picture? What I've thought in this situation is that each time five, if, if you know, when this transaction happened, it's witnessed by all five, they all took part, they all were part of it. And then the next one drags and might be a different five, but then it's probably involving one or a number of those, and they all form a, a consensus picture. Isn't that got an inbuilt way of actually increasing the How do you know these are real people? <coughs> what oh, stops me from running five different computers? Yes, yes, yeah. yeah. well, that's <laughs> like a separate issue. But if you, given that you that they, you can ascertain that their nodes and that they really did receive, I mean, the packets and really did take part. It's in a this. very hard problem to solve. Right. Like as an example, Tor has a problem kind of like that where. The Tor directory authorities need to know if Tor nodes on the network actually can provide the bandwidth they claim they do. Mm -hmm. And the way they solve the problem is by having a bunch of trusted people running mm -hmm. Tor directory authorities mm -hmm. do bandwidth tests. Mm -hmm. Works great, except it's rooted in trust. Mm -hmm. You know, if you take that but don't have some trusted entity validating that any well, of these people that's are real. Not, I, I don't mind putting a centralized component in here to actually help validate yeah. the, the Well, then you have an easy job. Yeah. yeah. But in that situation, if you're running a side a tree chain or a side chain and you had some way of, you know, being pretty certain that these people are real people and, and really did the transaction. Well, as an example, I mean, they could sign with their passports. Yeah, well, you know, yeah. just to throw I mean, this example. Also, these are trivial amounts. This is not like transferring yeah. large amount. This is, you know, cents, not yeah. hundreds of dollars. So that it's not a... You had a different order of potential problem. It's not a no, not worth. Of course, remember if I can go and steal like a few cents out of a system, mm -hmm. and I can automate it, I can steal a lot of money by it through automation. Yeah, but probably the ways of mitigating. We're not talking on a smart contract or something. Else, <laughs> yeah. Okay. When you were away, we answered your, uh, or Peter answered your question, so. It's one more uh, question. Uh, about, uh, <laughs> that, that says a lot, but uh, about putting data on the blockchain. So that's without burning, it comes all burning trees. Okay. Yeah. You may take it off to me as well, so. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think it was my question, well, no, specifically. No, no. Ah, I don't want to Switch names. Yeah. Then you're forgiven. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Right now, yeah. Yeah, I, I cannot really believe that nobody has anything. We solved world peace. Yeah. Right on time. Right on time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. Then uh, let's do it. <laughs> <laughs>